want you to open up your Bibles to the Hebrews Hall of Faith chapter. What chapter is that? Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. Who makes the coffee, David? Men. Men. Hebrews. Okay. Hebrews chapter 11. My message is entitled, Seeing Him Who is Invisible. Seeing Him Who is Invisible. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read verses... uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23, and we're going to go right through the verse number 27. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. The Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was in three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Imagine that. He didn't want to be Pharaoh's. She had been raising him for 40 years as a surrogate mother. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ. The Greek word is better rendered for Christ there. Probably have it in your margin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. That's what kept him going. His eye, looking down the corridors of time on the Lord. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible Word of God. Father, as we delve into this subject, seeing him who is invisible, Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes of faith, that we too, like Moses, would be able to see this God who is invisible right now. Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Beloved, our God is an invisible God. And right now, uh, the, a God that we worship, we cannot see Him with our naked eye. The Bible teaches us that He lives in a spiritual and an ethereal dimension, beloved. And he oscillates and vacillates and vibrates at a different frequency than you and I do. So our natural eyes cannot yet behold him. But someday, hallelujah, soon I hope, Christ will return. And the Bible says we will see him as he is. We will see him in all of his unveiled, all of his undiminished glory. That's known in theology as the beatific vision. The reformers called it the visio Dei. Beholding the very face of God. Beloved, the God I've taught you that sought the, uh, set the sun on fire is a thousand times brighter in his glory than that sun. So if you were to look on him right now in your flesh, if you were to see him, Zechariah says you would spontaneously combust because you need a glorified body, an immortal body, to be able to look on the Lord and survive it. Flesh and blood, Paul says, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, Moses is a graphic example of seeing him who is invisible through the eye of faith. And I want to give you a little bit of his backstory right now. I want you to look at verse 23. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. When Moses was born, his Hebrew parents, namely Amram his father, and Jacob and his mother, uh, beloved, saw that he was a proper child. Now, what does it mean when it says that he was a proper child? Some translations say he was a beautiful child, but it doesn't mean that, beloved. The word proper child, as taios fahidan, means that he was a very comely, handsome, and unusual t- uh, child whom they sensed had the call of God on his life. In other words, he seemed to be predestined to do great things for God. And mom and dad sensed that. The Holy Spirit made sure they sensed that. So he was a proper child. Sure, he was beautiful. Sure, he was handsome. But he also had an anointing on him. The call of God in his life, like John the Baptist in the very womb of his mother, the Bible says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you say amen out there? But you see, beloved... He was destined to do great things for God, but there was a problem at that time. At that time, the children of Israel down in Egypt were multiplying like rabbits. We see that in the scriptures. And they were far outnumbering the Egyptians, and this caused the Pharaoh great uh, pause. Why? 
because the children of Israel were his captives. They were his labor force. He used them to plant their, their gardens, to grow their food, to build their cities. But also, beloved, there was a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what was the problem that Pharaoh saw? He also saw that, uh, and he worried about this, that if the Egyptians had to fight another army, they were afraid that these Hebrews now would join that other army and fight against the Egyptians so they could be liberated from their Egyptian bondage. So he was in a real dilemma right now. So what did he decide to do? So Pharaoh passed a death edict. He passed a death decree. And so ultimately, that's how Moses get put in that basket, of course, and sent down the Nile. But he passed a death decree that said that every male child of Israel had to be killed by the midwives who delivered them like Shipra and Pua, which they refused to do, by the way, and God blessed them for that, amen, or by an Egyptian soldier. They had to get rid of all of these male children that were being born at that time. So this was a great risk. This was a, uh, uh, something that when Moses' parents did this, it could have meant their own death. So I want you to see where he came from. But Moses' parents, seeing, beloved, that he had been divinely favored by God, had great courage. They had great faith. Because what they did was they defied the king's order. And, of course, that itself would have been a death decree for them. Put them in that basket, sent them down the Nile, beloved, and they hid them away. But for three months before they did that, they were nourishing uh, uh, Moses. They were praying over Moses. They were whispering in his ear this great God of Israel and what he planned to do with them about the patriarch Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you say, well, how could his conscious mind understand that? Well, it couldn't, but his subconscious mind could, amen? And the Holy Spirit made sure that this was indelibly impressed on Moses' heart. How do we know that, beloved? Because he was indoctrinated in the truth about the God of Israel and the Messiah because we see that when Moses grew up, the Bible says he had strong faith. From birth, beloved, Moses learned and he knew all about the God and faith of the children of Israel from not only his parents, but by listening to what the Hebrew slaves were always talking about, uh, this great God. And consequently, the time finally came a time came when he had to make a life-altering uh, decision, and this was a tough decision, beloved. He had to choose to either identify himself with the Egyptians and all their polytheistic gods and their heathen way of life, or he was going to identify himself with the children of Israel and their one monotheistic God and their moral and spiritual uh, way of life. Now remember, Moses, Moses is in prime. He's 40 years of age. Everybody knows about Moses. <clears throat> so but Moses has to make a tough decision. You see, the religious influence of his parents and the Hebrews caused them to ultimately reject the former and heartily embrace the latter. There's no way I'm going to identify myself with the Egyptians. I'm a Hebrew, and I'm going to worship the God of the Hebrews. That was his ultimate decision. And boy, beloved, I hope you listen to what I'm saying in my message this morning. So during those years when he served as a very important person in the court of Pharaoh, his eye of faith was always still fixed and focused on someday seeing him who is invisible. Moses' faith never wavered from that. It was fixed. It was focused. Remember, he did not have the scriptures yet. He had only heard, passed down through oral tradition about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Deliverer that was going to liberate the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, listen to me. Like Moses, we Christians have to sometimes make tough, life-altering choices and decisions that will alter the course of our life. And that decision will either help us or it will hinder us from seeing him who is invisible depending upon the quality and the quantity of our faith. In other words, I'm saying this. If we have a weak and we have a waning and we have a wavering faith, beloved, when some seemingly great opportunity knocks, it seems lucrative. The first thing people normally do, they don't even think about their soul. They don't even think about how it's going to affect their faith. My, my, look at the opportunity. Well, I must have great luck right now. I'm really being blessed. But you listen to me. Those with weak and waning faith, they're the ones that think like that. 
And then unlike Moses, we will always choose what seems to be the most lucrative and profitable for us, even if it hinders our eye of faith from being focused on God. Would you say amen out there? You say, beloved, then unlike Moses, he will always choose the easiest and far less troublesome route, even if it hinders our eye of faith from seeing him who is invisible. And then unlike Moses, beloved, we'll always choose to do what's best for our earthly life here and now, even if it hinders our eye of faith, no matter how it affects us, even if we don't even think about seeing him who is invisible, we'll just go and do what we want to do. Most Christians live their life like that, sorry to say, because we have the world's philosophy inside of us. Hey, man, you got an opportunity right now, seize it, grab it, you owe it to yourself. Don't you hear that on the news and uh, you see athletes saying that, you gain the world, you lose your soul, amen? But beloved, contrary, whereas those who have a spiritually strong faith, those who have their spiritual conviction screwed down tight, those who have their eye of faith always fixed and focused on seeing him who is invisible like Moses did will never ever do that for fear it will ruin their faith, it will harm their salvation, it will hinder their pursuit of this high and lofty goal and they will miss seeing him who is invisible altogether. In other words, God is always Lord over their life. He's always filling their mind, filling their heart, filling their soul. Amen. So they're poignantly aware of this God. You say, well, pastor, you don't know what I've been through. You haven't been through what Jesus has. You haven't been through what Moses has. You haven't been through what a lot of people have. There's Christians right now that are hiding underground that don't have anything, that are being chased and imprisoned and killed and murdered and martyred, and we're complaining. Amen? And they're doing that. Why? Because they've got their eye fixed. They're looking at him who is invisible on this great God. And so, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying they always put their faith before their finances. People like this always put their soul before their flesh. People like this always put their eternal life before their earthly life. Hey, beloved, do you do this or just the opposite? Do you put your finances before your faith? Do you put your flesh before your soul? Do you put your earthly life before your eternal life? Do you understand the gift of eternal life that you have, God's life, and given to you? And yet, beloved, we see it, not for what it is, how invaluable and priceless and precious it really is. As Paul said, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. So, beloved, as we read the story about Moses, we see that Moses had a strong and he had a self-denying and Moses had a sacrificial type of faith that daily led him to morally and spiritually strive in hot pursuit of this God and keep him focused on seeing him who is invisible. And by the way, this is the only type of faith that will enable you to be able to do that too. You can't have willy-nilly uh, Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. He was from Tennessee. You can't straddle the fence with God. There's no neutrality in this battle. What side are you on? You have to make a decision in your life. Amen? So how did Moses develop this strong? How did he develop this self-denying and sacrificial uh, faith, beloved? Especially when Moses did not yet have the scriptures like we do today. Moses did not have the church like we do today. He didn't have the fellowship with the saints like that. Moses did not have pastors and teachers to be able to instruct him in the right ways of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how in the world was he able to do this, beloved? I want you to pay close attention. In order to have a faith like Moses, then we need to decide to do exactly what he did. And you say, preacher, what was that? Good question. He made see, seeing him who was invisible, listen to me now, the top priority in his life. Is it yours? He made seeing him who is invisible. Listen to me now, the top pursuit in his life. Is it yours? Or is it your job? Is it your career? Or is it your family? Or whatever it may be, the pursuit of money and happiness. So that was totally caught. Moses had all of that. You see, beloved, he made seeing whom was invisible the top practice and priority and goal 
of his life, not his job and not his career and not his position and not his nobility and not his family or friends, but seeing God, this God who was invisible, was the absolute top priority of his life. And the question is, is it yours? Have you ever done that? I try to renew my faith every day. From the moment I open up my eyes, and that's the truth, and the Lord knows it. Lord, be with me today. Fill me with your Holy Ghost. Keep me, let me keep you foremost in my mind today. One step at a time. One day at a time. Would you say amen out there? One problem at a time. So to have a strong and self-denying and steady type of faith, beloved, that daily focuses on seeing him who is invisible, then we too, like Moses did, have to choose to decide to prioritize our life and our pursuit of God as the number one thing we do in our life. I didn't say the number two thing. I didn't say the number six thing. I didn't say the fourth thing. I said the number one thing we do in our life. Oh, beloved, if you could understand how Satan is fighting you, trying to rob your soul. He doesn't want you to cross the finish line. He wants you to be distracted with everything. He wants you to be upset in your life. He wants you to be mad at God. And a lot of people like fall for it. Instead of seeing the spiritual battle for what it is. So then we too, like Moses did, beloved, have to choose to make following Christ. To going to heaven. To protecting our soul. And seeing him who is invisible, the primary goal and quest of our life, far above everyone and everything else. I'm saying, beloved, your faith. I'm saying your soul and your salvation. I'm saying your eternal life. Your desire of seeing him who is invisible must be the top priority and pers- and they must be the pearls of great price, beloved, in your life like it was with Moses. Pearls of great price. You can't buy them. Is it yours? Is it yours or have you lost sight of this? It is the pearl of great price. Would you sell the field to buy that pearl? Would you sell your home to buy that pearl? No, instead people are selling their soul of this world. And that's a sad fact. So, beloved, to have a strong and self-denying and sacrificing faith like Moses, then we, like him, we too, must give up some things to gain some things. Then we too, ladies and gentlemen, must forsake some things to be able to partake of some heavenly things. Would you say amen? Then we too must give up uh, or, or let go some things so we can lay hold of some things that God has promised us. Would you say amen to that? Say, I always told you in this life, you hold on to everything with a feather grip. This is not your home. This is not your final resting place. You're but a pilgrim and a stranger that's passing through on your way to glory. You're a citizen of two countries, the United States of America and the heavenly country, the United States of America will be long gone, but the kingdom of God will endure forever. Come on and say amen out there. So, beloved, seeing him who was invisible required Moses, and it requires us to have to renounce several notable things in our life. He, and I may add we, must renounce, number one, our popularity. Our popularity. I want you to look at verse 24. Hebrews eleven twenty four, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Beloved, Moses, think about this, was now about 40 years of age. He'd been reared by Pharaoh's daughter. He, he probably called her mom. I mean, it was a close relationship, don't you think? He had descended from Hebrew slaves, beloved, but for the last and past 40 years, he is reared up by an Egyptian. That is Pharaoh's daughter, of course, and he was reared right in the royal palace, right in Egypt. And this meant that he was a high profile, a noble member in and of the royal family of uh, Pharaoh, beloved, with all of its regal power and prestige and privileges. And consequently, everyone in Egypt knew about Moses, beloved. He was held in high honor, high esteem, high regard. He was held in high reputation, not only by the friends in Egypt, by the foes that surrounded him. They all knew Moses someday would be heir apparent to the throne of Pharaoh. He would become the next Pharaoh. And when they said the name Pharaoh, many of their enemies trembled uh, in their boots. 
You see what I'm saying to you, beloved. But to make this official, for him to ever become the Pharaoh of Egypt, <clears throat> he had to make some real tough choices. Let me talk about one for a little bit. One of the first choices he had to do was renounce his Hebrew heritage and be legally made an Egyptian by being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter into her and Pharaoh's royal family so he could now become Pharaoh's lawful grandson, and be his lawful heir, and be his lawful successor. You see, he had to be quote-unquote an Egyptian legally, officially. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, this was a real crisis in his life. He had to decide if he wanted to be identified as an Egyptian the rest of his life or be identified with the Hebrew slaves. Now remember, your royal, your nobility right now. Everybody's looking at you. You're, you're number two in the kingdom of Egypt. So he has to decide, am I going to be identified with the Egyptians or am I going to be identified with the Hebrew slaves? Or am I going to be identified with the children of Israel? Am I going to be identified with these despised people of God who claimed that they were the offspring of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to which all of the promises of God were made? Especially the coming of the Messiah, the Deliverer, who would bring them out of the land of Egypt. And so, beloved, Moses, must have, his mind must have been racing. I know mine would be. How about yours? I'm sure in nanoseconds, all of these things are flashing through Moses' mind because he was a very intelligent person. You see, folks, everything he possessed, everything he was, everything he could and would be in the future was on the line right now and was depending upon the fateful choice that he would make that would alter the rest of his life and all of eternity. You ever had to make a choice like that? You see, beloved, he had to decide if he wanted to be a benefactor of fame or shame. He had to decide if he wanted to be a benefactor of royalty or of poverty. He had to decide if he wanted to be a benefactor of the living God's eternal promises of Pharaoh's earthly and temporary promises. But you see, Moses was an Egyptian prince at this time, and he had a good view of everything that was going on in the kingdom. And so he had already seen enough mistreatment of the Hebrews by the Egyptians. They would whip them. The taskmasters would take them to task. And so understanding his racial lineage and his spiritual heritage, he knew that he was of better blood than doing that. Amen? And he knew, ladies and gentlemen, he was a member of God's chosen people. He was a Hebrew. And he knew he could not step down from his divine nobility just to take on Egyptian royalty. And lastly, beloved, he knew he uh, uh, would now forever miss seeing him who was invisible if he made the wrong choice. So he decides, I'm not going to betray my nationality. I'm not going to betray my eternality just to win a few short years of earthly fame and popularity like a lot of people would do. A lot of people sell their soul for rock and roll. In other words, they'll do whatever it takes to be successful, to make money. They don't care. Oh, yeah, I was saved one time. God's going to take me to heaven. You've got a snowball's chance of hell of getting there with that kind of an attitude. I don't see any real repentance in that. I don't see any real righteousness in that. I don't see any real dedication and devotion in that. I don't see any real faithfulness in that. How about you? You see, beloved, so... The day finally came. He was going to be publicly adopted by Pharaoh's daughter into Pharaoh's family as the heir apparent through the throne. And when it was posed to him, the Bible says that Moses, he flatly refused. That word refused, arneomai, means this. It means that he utterly denied, he utterly rejected, he utterly declined the high and royal offer and uh, privilege, beloved, of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity of obtaining such a regal and earthly privilege and position that was now being offered to him. No one else on this earth had that opportunity. No one else on this earth had an offer like that. He could have been a multi-cazillionaire multiplied many more times and have all the treasures of Egypt, which I'll talk about later. But you see, folks, consequently, because we know the backstory now, we know history, 
Redemptive history has shown us that instead of him occupying a line or two of hieroglyphics on some obscure, mummified tomb like all the pharaohs, instead he became memorialized forever in God's eternal book, this book right here, which is the infallible Word of God. Would you say amen? They will live forever and ever. Forever, O Lord, David said, Thy word, thy word is settled in heaven. Come on and say amen out there. Forever, O Lord, forever, thy word is settled in heaven. So instead of him being found in a museum as an Egyptian mummy, beloved, he is still being celebrated as one of the most great and famous men of God who ever walked the top side of this earth. So let me ask you a question. Are you like Moses? Would you, will you, do as he did when some tempting and temporal opportunity that could enrich you, that could elevate your status in life, knocks on your door, but could possibly ruin your faith and rob your soul? What would you do if you were in Moses' shoes? Sorry to say, most Christians would say this. I can still believe in God. I can still be a Christian, and I can do real good if I get to be the Pharaoh. I can really help people out. Isn't it amazing? We're going to justify what we're doing. In other words, I'll have everything the world has to offer in heaven to boot. Amen? Sounds good, doesn't it? That's what most Christians would. They would justify in their heart. And Jesus said, listen to me, you can't do that. You can't have two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, you'll despise the one and be faithful to the other. One or the other, you need to make a decision. So I'm asking you, beloved, what would you do? Would you be like Moses, beloved? Is seeing him who is invisible such a vitally important top priority? Is it a primary goal in your life like that of Moses? It's such a goal, beloved. It's such a priority that you're willing to renounce your status or you're really willing to renounce a job or willing to renounce uh, an opportunity or comforts or popularity. You're willing to renounce your fame just so you can be dedicated and devoted to as a Christian and you can see who him who's invisible. I know many a woman who was a waitress making all kinds of money serving booze from the tips and they became a Christian and immediately without anybody teaching them one thing, they knew in their heart they could not do that anymore. They could not sell alcohol. Habakkuk 2.4 says, Woe unto him that gives alcohol to his neighbor and gets him drunk. Woe unto that person. Why? Because you serve alcohol to somebody else and they have a problem, beloved, or somebody watches you and they fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, You're guilty. And they perish, God says, You're going to too. So they quit the job. And they went out and looked for another job. Sometimes they didn't pay what they were making. But you see, God had something bad. They were looking at seeing him who is invisible? Would you say amen out there? Not just selling alcohol so they can make money and put it in their pocket. You want to drink alcohol, drink in the privacy of your house. Don't offend anybody. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, unlike Moses, many refuse to renounce anything. Many refuse to give up anything. Many refuse to forego anything to see him who is invisible. And when some alluring or some attractive opportunity arises to enrich themselves, then what they do is they end up falling for Satan's ploy. I told you, they sell their soul for rock and roll. All they seem to be able to see is, you know what, I can make more money. Or I can be more wealthy. Or, you know, I can be more comfortable. Or I'll have a higher status. But you see, beloved, when you think like that and you do that, then you're going to miss seeing him who is invisible. So point number one, beloved, he and we must renounce our popularity if it stands in the way of us following after God. Number two, our pleasures. Our pleasures. We must renounce our pleasures. Look what he says in verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, you think that would be an easy choice. Do you want to suffer? No way. I can give you pleasures. Okay. <laughs> you see, beloved, I want you to notice here, when you look at this text, you see that Moses was a visionary. In other words, beloved, he wasn't blinded by the light. Amen. He was farsighted, not short-sighted like many Christians, unfortunately, are today. All the while as he grew up as an Egyptian, all the while that he served in Pharaoh's court, 
all the while that he enjoyed the wealth and the riches and the fame of royalty and nobility, his eye of faith never lost sight of someday I will cross the finish line and I will see him who is invisible. Would you say amen out there? I'll see the visio day. I'll see the beatific vision. Look on God and I'll see him face to face and I'll know him even as I am known by him. Like a razor in the laser, he was focused on this God. You see, beloved, he kept his eye of faith on that prize. He kept his eye of faith on that goal and that objective. I want to ask you, does that sound like you? Have you lost sight of this high and lofty goal in your life? You see, Moses never did. In spite of everything, imagine the pulls, the temptations he must have been having, ladies and gentlemen. I've never had too many people wait on me except Ellie. (laughs) And you probably haven't had too many people wait on you, amen? But imagine being someone that everybody falls at your feet doing whatever they can for you. And you don't want for anything. Everything's at your fingertips. I mean, the world's your oyster, so to speak. But you see, beloved, what Moses did is his faith had a long-range perspective that looked down the corridors of time. The question is, does yours do that? Are you so nearsighted, short-sighted? All you see is, what's happening around me right now? This is what I'm going through right now. Are you looking down the... Beloved, good night. What do you expect is going to happen to you as a Christian in this life? Satan's against you. The world's against you. Everything is against you except God. And if God be for us... Who can be against us? Come on and say amen. God be for us. Oh, we read the scriptures, but do we believe them? Do we obey them? Do we internalize them? And say, God, I belong to you. I'm your child. I'm your saint. I'm your servant. Do with me whatever you want to do. Because I know you'll never leave me nor forsake me. You see, beloved, he always kept this goal in the forefront of his mind. The question is, do you? And by doing that, it moved and motivated Moses to unequivocally make the right decision. So much so that verse 25, if you look at it, says he was willing to even suffer affliction. That is, he was willing to be associated now with the company and fellowship of God's people and also share in and partake of the same abusive persecution and mistreatment and oppression of them by the Egyptians. Words, Moses said this, that I am willing right now to align myself with the children of Israel and the same ill treatment they will suffer, then I'll suffer also. I don't care if I was brought up in the royal palace. I don't care if I'm Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, I mean, Pharaoh's daughter raised me. I don't care about that. <laughs> I am Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> now, he wasn't transgender. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> Hey, you come up here and try this. <laughs> you see, folks, what I'm saying to you is this. Not only that, but Moses also renounced enjoying, relishing in all of the pleasures. It says here, echo is that Greek word. That is all of the iniquitous and immoral, fleshy, inordinate, sensual desires, material delights of the Egyptians. Because as children here, I won't get into it, but if you ever read the back story of the history about it, beloved, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about right now. But I won't go that route. Why, beloved? Because he knew that they'd only be, notice what your text says. It says for a season, proskahiros. That is, they'd only be but temporal, temporal and transient pleasures at best because as compared to the eternal blessing, benefit, and bountings of seeing him who was invisible, they were nothing in comparison. Amen? That's like you having a huge oyster. Or, uh, you know, the, the, I always thought about this. When you look at Revelation 21, you see the city of God, the celestial city of God, the new Jerusalem. And it says, each gate was a pearl. There, that'd be some mighty big oysters. <laughs> Usually you have a little grain of sand and you make a pearl, right? This must have been a mighty mountain. <laughs> that was a huge, huge oyster. But you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. We Christians need to learn this invaluable lesson. In 1 John 2, 
verses 15 through 17. You know the text, but you know the context. The Gnostics were saying this at that time to John and the Johannine epistles. They were saying, listen, the only thing that matters is your spirit. Your flesh is going to deteriorate. It's going to die. It's evil. So all that matters is your spirit. But you see, beloved, John knew that God redeems us body, soul, and spirit. And our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. And we belong to Him. So 1 John 2, 15 through 17, John says to his readers, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth, he that doeth, he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. And the word passeth away there is in the Greek is a present tense verb, is passing away even as I'm speaking, is what John was saying. All throughout the Bible, the Bible tells us this world is going to pass away. This isn't it, amen? You see, beloved, sadly, many in these last days have taken their eye of faith off of seeing him who was invisible. Why are they doing that? just to enjoy the passing and fleeting momentary fleshy and materialistic pleasures of this world that but endure, endure for a while and then quickly vanish away, sad to say, along with their salvation. James says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then poof, vanisheth away. What is your life? I love it. Imagine an ant standing next to the biggest mammoth elephant there ever was. That's what your life is compared to eternity. This world is going to pass away. Your life is going to pass away. Your problems, listen, and it came to pass, amen? No, some may come to stay, but it came to pass, okay? And it will come to pass when Jesus comes back. You see, folks... Moses didn't have the kind of vision that a lot of people do today. No way, not Moses. The perspective of seeing him who was in Israel led him to share in the privilege of suffering. He counted a privilege. The apostles said they were counted worthy to be able to suffer for Christ. Amen? Moses said, I'm kind of worthy to suffer the ill treatment of my own people, the children of Israel. They're God's people. And it's of greater blessing and pleasure to me than ever imbibing in the temporal pleasures of Pharaoh's court. Beloved, you can't let that truth slip out of your mind, the forefront of your mind. You can't do it. In these last days, we are in the battle like never before. Social media has ruined most. Facebook has ruined. Instagram has ruined most people. Listen, beloved, listen to me. I'm not saying this to condemn anyone, but we have turned into people that love to hear gossip. And one people repeats one one person repeats one thing and then posts it and then posts it and they post it and all of a sudden it's true because they're posting it right now. Gossip, gossip, gossip. You know what God says about gossip? You ought to read it. You'd be better off spending some time praying or walking with God or doing things for Him or serving in the church or doing something instead of being caught up in Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, whatever it is. You see, beloved, you need to be just like Moses. In other words, to let nothing in this world distract you from seeing him who was invisible. To let no one in this world distract you from seeing him who was invisible. To let not nearsightedness stop you or distract you from seeing him who was invisible. Take your eyes off your problem and put it onto the God of your problem. Don't you let any temporal worldly opportunity or delight, any temporal pleasure or enjoyment, love, don't let anything divert your attention away from your long-range goal of someday seeing him who is invisible. Listen, when I say long-range goal, I'm old enough to drop right now, and I could, I, that goal could be today, amen? And it could be for you too. You could get in a car accident on the way home. Are you ready to see him who is invisible? You can have a terminal disease that can come on you that quick. And you will meet him who is invisible. What will you say to him at that time? Well, I meant to. I was going to. You see, I was going to put it away when I... 
No, God says, you love the world too much. You love the world more than you love me. When did you ever get involved in my church? When did you ever serve me? That's what he's going to say to you. You love me enough to give this up or give that up? Like I gave everything up for you? You see, beloved, I'm saying to you so daily, fix and focus the eye of your faith on your salvation and fix and focus daily the eye of your faith on going to heaven and on eternal life and on the kingdom of God and see in Him that God who is invisible, who is King of kings and Lord of lords and the kingdom of God. Now, sure, beloved, you may have to suffer affliction with God's people for a while like Moses did. And sure, you may have to suffer affliction for a while, beloved, with some adversities or persecution, beloved, with God's people or some hardships with God's people. Listen to me now. You stand for anything and you start speaking the truth, that was one of the reasons I never wanted to go on YouTube. That's one of the reasons I never wanted to go on TV. Because I know how people start slinging mud at you and accusing you and threatening you. Believe me, I know. You can get my emails, phone calls. I get two in my office right now. Two in my office right now. Using you as a weapon. I won't go any farther than that. But you see, beloved, we may have to suffer with God's people for a while, but as the song says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. Life trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One look in His dear face, all problems will erase. So let us run the race till we see God. Now, if you want me to sing five dollars, and I'll sell the truck outside. It'll be worth it all when you see. Imagine, beloved, that little thing you gave up. You're looking at the glory of the living Christ. And the heaven, the seraphim, can't even behold God in His glory. They have to take two of their wings and cover their face because they can't look on the glory of God. And you're going to be able to do that someday. And you had to give up a pity little job? Or you had to give up this pity little thing over here in the world? You had to give that up? Oh, my. How? Boy, we need to get our heads screwed on, right? Amen. The Bible, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. I won't quote the rest to you. But he says, let this mind, that self-denying mind, that humbling mind, that uh, kind of mind that will do anything for God, let it be in you like it was in Christ Jesus. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, you can even look at it in your scripture. He says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. But notice what he says. And let us run with patience, he says, the race that is set before us. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? Seeing God in all his glory, being glorified, sitting on the throne of the universe. He kept it in the forefront of his mind. I know I've got to go through the cross. I know they're going to nail me to the cross. I know they're going to whip me until I'm so disfigured and my blood's pouring out of me. I know they're going to do that, but blessed be God, I know I'm going to die, but I know I'm going to resurrect. I know I'm going to ascend to heaven. I know I'm going to be enthroned on the universe as King of kings and Lord of lords. And he set that before his eyes. He kept that in the forefront of his mind. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Think about him that endured such contradiction of sins against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your own mind. And he says, For you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The word that concerns me there is yet. You have not yet. The day may come when you have to, to strive against sin. You have not yet, he says, resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know, my Bible says in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, For so persecuted the prophets that were before you. You're in good company, amen. You know, my Bible says in Hebrews eleven thirty six 36, that the Old Testament saints like Moses who suffered trials and cruel mockings 
and scourgings and imprisonment, beloved. Notice it says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not, uh, should, uh, not be made perfect. In other words, beloved, they suffered these mockings and scourgings and imprisonment. Why? Because they were dedicated to seeing him who was invisible. And they did not have the scriptures. Just word of mouth being passed down, but they believed it so much, and the Holy Spirit indelibly impressed, impressed it on their mind and their soul and their spirit. My Bible says, Paul writing to the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, he says, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also deny or disown us. So there's a lot at stake, isn't there, for a Christian? And that's why we need to make a decision. Who are we for? If God be for us, who can be against us? But who are you for? Well, I'm for God, but I love the world. Well, <laughs> you can't have them both, so you need to make your decision. I'm saying, beloved, it's easy to be deceived by the temporary benefits of great wealth. And it's easy to be deceived by the temporary benefits of status and prestige and fame and popularity, beloved, and be blind to the long-range benefits in the eternal kingdom of God. So I'm saying the eye of faith must look beyond the fleeting values of this evil world system to the full and future eternal blessings, benefits, and bounties in the eternal kingdom of heaven. You have to look at it, beloved, through the eye of faith. You have to keep focusing on it. But now, you know, people who stand there and they build their muscles because they're trying to be like Pastor Joel. I, I told you, mine's a soggy cheerio. You don't want to be like me. And yet your mind is a muscle, and the very few people exercise that because it's tougher. You know, much study is a weariness to the flesh, the Bible says. Have you ever really wrestled with something? I know when I, have, I, know when I had to learn Greek and Hebrew, and I was an older man at that time. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is a young man's game. <laughs> and your mind's going crazy, and you're trying to remember the alphabet. And, how it, and then finally it all came together. I, in fact, to be honest with you, I taught myself more Greek and Hebrew then I learned in seminary. I know a little Greek. He has a pizza shop down the street here. Yeah, he's a tailor. He says, Euripides and Almendides. <laughs> I know a little Hebrew, too. He's got a haberdashery shop down the street. <laughs> you see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, so you need to renounce any pleasure or any practice, any popularity that will keep you from seeing him who is invisible. So what have we learned so far? We must renounce our popularity. We must renounce any pleasure. We must renounce, number three, our prosperity. Look what he says in verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of, of for Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of reward. Beloved, I want you to note here the mindset of Moses. Unlike many today, he could care less about fame and fortune. So many people, I want to be famous or I want fortune. I don't care. I know I've got a good voice and I know instead of singing Christian songs, I'm only making a dime. I'm going to try to make it so the world will buy everything I have. All right, sing in the world, but have a good, make it good songs, moral songs, Christian songs, amen? Or, or, uh, like the old timers used to sing, okay? You see, beloved, notice what he says in your text there. He was esteeming, hageomai. That is, he deeply and genuinely considered and countered the hostile reproach on adismos. That is, the adversarial rebukes and disapproval and criticisms and the castigations and the berating he took for Christ, the coming Messiah, which to him was the greatest of all treasures, and he turned his back on the temporal treasures and pleasures of Egypt. You ever sat down and said, what's really important to me? What is it that's really important to me that drives me, that gets me out of bed in the morning? Oh, I know i got to pay my bills and I know I have to make some money. I'm not talking about that. But what is it that's the most important thing in your life? Is it your salvation? Is it you seeing God? Is it you going to heaven? Is it the gift of eternal life? It is to me. You know, you'll see that when you get older too, beloved. Believe me when I tell you that. You'll see that. 
I always tell my wife, you know what I miss the most as an older person now? My strength. Beloved, I, I, I used to be as strong as an ox. I'm not saying that boastfully. Now, Ellie has to pick me up. <laughs> I don't know who's going to pick her up. That's the question. <laughs> But you notice it, beloved, and the things you took for granted. I, I've got a big yard, and I've got to take care of it. I can't tell you what it takes me to do it. And before, I could zip, zip, zip. In fact, I used to do it all by hand, a push mower, until I got to sit down. Now I've got a 49-feet uh, mower deck, so I can take one swipe. <laughs> takes me 10 minutes to come in. You all done, Joel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, Joel, you chewed up the garden, you chewed up the back porch. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here, is that he saw the huge and fabulous treasure houses of Egypt were worthless in light of eternity. Why? Because he knew they'd never give him salvation. He knew they'd never give him eternal life. They, he knew they'd never get him into heaven. So they're worthless. I'm not going to give up eternity in heaven with God for these mis- mere fodder down here. And we shouldn't either, amen? Oh, if we could only grasp the concept that true wealth is eternal. So don't you ever forfeit your eternal rewards for temporal rewards, beloved. I've always told you, don't sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the temporal, amen? Don't do it. Listen to me, you kids that are growing up, don't you do it. I know you've got your future ahead of you. If you keep God at the forefront of your mind. And so, beloved, like Moses, be willing to renounce and make decisions and sacrifices now to get and receive greater rewards later. And that's why Moses chose to suffer the same kind of reproach for Christ. And, beloved, he suffered the reproach for Christ because ultimately Christ suffered his reproach later on as his Lord and Savior on the cross at Calvary. Amen? Because he knew... Genesis 3.15, the proto-evangelium. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And thou shalt crush his head, and he's going to bruise your heel. And I told you, you can recover from a bruised heel, but not from a crushed head. And that was the scarlet throat of redemption that went all the way through the Old Testament, the coming of God's Messiah. And Moses heard about that. So, beloved, notice what he says right here. That Moses valued this more than all the combined wealth of Pharaoh. Can you say this, beloved? It says he had respect, oboblepo. That is, he had steadfast, attentive, intent, inner mental, moral, and spiritual gaze that counted the cost and was willing to look away from everything else in this world. And notice what it says here, to the recompense of the reward, of Mestapo Desiah. That is, to the gift, the eternal gift and payment God would bestow on him through the Messiah. So, beloved... Moses was willing he, uh, he, uh, to turn his back on everything just so he could have God. Seeing him who was invisible, beloved, meant more to Moses than popularity in Egypt. Does it mean more to you? Seeing him who was invisible meant more to Moses than pleasures of Egypt, the prosperity of Egypt. Does it to you? Will you ever renounce anything just to see him who was invisible? And that gives me my last point, and I'll make it quick. I told you we may have to renounce our popularity, our pleasures, our prosperity. And number four, beloved, our position. Our position. Look what he says in verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Beloved, Moses forsook being king, the Pharaoh of Egypt. In other words, He left his past behind, and he never again looked back to Egypt. You know, the Bible says that's what we're supposed to do in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Forgetting those things which are behind, looking forward unto those things which are ahead, I press for the mark, for the the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what Moses did. He must have read Paul's writing. I don't think so. (laughs) But, beloved, in so doing, Moses now became God's deliverer. He turns his back on being king of Pharaoh, and he became God's leader. He became God's mediator, God's lawgiver, God's prophet. And blessed be God, the Bible says Moses was a friend of God. So wasn't Daniel. 
I hope, I've said to the Lord, I hope you can say about me that Joel is my friend. I ask God that all the time. Can you say that about me, that Joel? You see, beloved, the blessings of the former greatly pales in comparison to the eternal blessings and benefits and bountings of the latter. So the Bible says here, notice the word endured. He endured, keter eo. That is, he persevered, he withstood all of the hardships, all the deprivations, and he forfeited the positions of grandeur to focus his loyalty and attention on seeing him who was invisible. He went from the highest high to being a nomad in the land of Midian, a shepherd, beloved. And they were the last on the totem pole in them days, weren't they? Imagine the royalty, your nails are uh, paired and your hair's combed and oiled and you're fragrant. Now you're with sheep. And I've got sheep next door and I know about sheep. <laughs> the question is this, what will you forsake and endure? What would you do, beloved, for the privilege and opportunity that God has given you right now to see him, him who is invisible? Give up your popularity? Are you willing to do that? Would you give up? your pleasures and your prosperity? Would you give up your position? A lot of us are going to have to in the last days. A lot of us are going to have to flee from our homes in the last days. A lot of us are going to have to make a decision. Are you one of them? Is Pastor Joel your pastor? No, never heard of him. <laughs> you too when they arrest you. I don't know them. I, do it. I never saw the person. That's tit for tat, right? No, I have to love my enemies. <laughs> you know, in Scripture, Egypt, the Bible says, is the type of this evil world system, and we are exhorted to separate from it if we truly want to have the hope of ever seeing him who's invisible. So, beloved, let me close with this. Be like Moses. Look at Moses. You've got more advantages than he ever had, spiritually speaking. Look at Moses, beloved, and be willing to forsake anything, anyone, that will hinder you from seeing him who is invisible. All of the figures in this chapter, Paul says, these things are written for our example. For our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. These are our heroes. Not some country rock star. Not some actor. Not some CEO of some company. Not some billionaire. You want to get to heaven? Make these people your heroes. Superheroes. Put yourself in their shoes. Could I have done what Sarah did at 90-something years of age and had a baby? Could I have built an ark to the saving of my house like Noah that took me 120 years? Could I be like Jacob or could I be like Isaac? Could I be like Gideon? Have that same grace and anointing and power and spirit upon me? And do what they did because I want to see him who is invisible. Do you want to see him who is invisible? Amen. So don't I. Let's go to the throne.